uh, simplify our problems, I would say that we've gotten to this mess because we have sent too many people to Washington uh, that have not taken their oath of office seriously and uh, have not uh, done what they should have. I think the people have been lax and they keep getting them reelected. So it's not all just the Congress and just the President. The people have been uh, lax as well. But we need to, you know, change this by changing the people's attitude about what the government should be doing. And let me tell you, the government under our Constitution is not supposed to be running a welfare state nor a warfare state. It's there to protect our liberties. That's yeah. Yeah. crisis now mainly for economic reasons. Four or five years ago, you know, the bubble burst. A few of us talked about that over the years, especially the Austrian free market economists. They have been right on their predictions and they have predicted that this would come and it did come. But uh, now the, most of the people realize, not only in this country, but around the world, this is not a U.S. problem. Because we're living with a problem that has been developed differently than ever before. Because we have been the issuer of a fiat currency called the dollar. And the dollar has been used as a reserve currency as if it were gold. And therefore, the inflationary problems of the world and all the distortions and all the debt crisis is worldwide. And therefore, we're facing this a, a crisis bigger than ever. So the recognition is there. And this is, this is not all that bad because it's when people live with their head in the sand that we keep doing the same thing over and over again. And right now, people are waking up and saying, you can't solve the problem with too much spending and too much borrowing and too much debt and too much printing press money by merely doing the same thing over and over again. So that's why I'm optimistic that the people know now that we can't continue on the same course that we have been doing for at least the last 40 to 50 years. The economy is obviously the big issue and certainly in a state like Michigan that is the big issue and uh, it has to be addressed. Some states do better than other states. There are some states in the south that do better than the states in the north. And, and, and it's not all accident. The federal government does a lousy job providing the environment necessary to be competitive and to uh, be able to compete in, throughout the world. Because they overtax, they overregulate, and they distort the economy with the inflation, distort the interest rates. So the federal government has a lot of responsibility, in particular, there's one group of people that we should deal with, and I'll talk more about that. And that is that group that's located over in the Federal Reserve Building. End of that! 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 And now that we want to talk about the Federal Reserve System, uh, you know, it's been there, it's been around for 99 years, and they've literally destroyed 99% of the dollar they inherited in 1913. So they're doing a wonderful job, and one of their mandates is to, one of their mandates is a stable dollar and stable prices. I don't think they've done a very good job. The other mandate they have is uh, is low unemployment, and they haven't done a very good job there either. But but the, the problems that the Federal Reserve, uh, the Federal Reserve, and the, uh, the federal government with the mandates and the regulations and all that—that's a big thing. But some states suffer more because some states put a greater burden because you have local regulations. And I think the issue mentioned in the introduction it is a big issue, and that is the uh, cost of labor. The cost of labor should be competitive. People should be able to, uh, you know, negotiate. And the, and the contract is what's supposed to be a deal and decide how workers come together and business people come together. There should be no laws prohibiting the uh, organization of labor. Labor should have a right to organize and talk. with business and business and labor should come together. This is the way a market would work. Who knows, in a totally free market, you might have competitive unions for all that we know to try to compete for the best job and provide the best, uh, best worker. 
But it's when, it's in 1935 when they didn't understand the Depression. They, they claimed the Depression came about because of free markets, capitalism, huh. and the gold standard. So therefore, what did they do? They destroyed the gold standard and brought up a lot more regulations and destroyed the free market and gave us this intervention Keynesianism, which we've been living with uh, for a long, long time. But, um, in 1935, they gave us the National Labor Relations Act, and uh, this this distorted the balance. It didn't deal with uh, you know the right to organize and the right to contract. It said if you want to get together and organize, you have special power. So when they talk about getting workers' rights back, I think they're misleading because they're not rights to get a clout from the government. Now, big business gets clouts too, and that's wrong, but big labor is not supposed to get better, bigger powers. Now, the compensation that has been conserved over the years have states have gone and tried to get around this by having right to work laws and trying to compensate for the special power uh, that have been granted to, to, to the unions. So this is uh, this distorts the market, and the states that have not compensated, they have suffered the very most, and therefore it can't, uh, it, it has to be uh, addressed. Now I support a national uh, right to work law, and some of the other candidates do not support that law, even though they are conservative Republicans. <laughs> But it's in, the first question that should come if somebody wants to challenge you is, well, how can you support a national law? You don't believe in these national laws. What's going on? Well, actually, it isn't a new law, a new process. It's to cancel out that special authority. It's to remove a special power and clout that was given in 1935. So that would be a big help for a state like this if, if the economy, if you want to get the economy moving again. I just think of the companies that got into trouble in this in this breakdown uh, just four or five years ago, the auto companies that got into trouble. There were a lot of auto, auto companies that were in the South run by other co companies and they didn't have the same problem. So uh, to put our head in the sand and say that uh, this has to happen uh, and, and persist. But even the bailouts of the company, it, it wasn't... Once again, governments are supposed to be there to guarantee contracts, protect contracts, enforce contracts. So what did the government do? Come in when they bailed out. They took money from people they shouldn't have taken money to and then given the money in the bailout and protected individuals that didn't deserve the protection. So the government should be restrained to protecting contract, protecting the marketplace, protecting private property, and they ought to reduce the amount of regulations and they ought to give us a sound currency. That's what would help our economy. Yeah. Is the inability of politicians to allow the correction to occur. Corrections, when mistakes are made, you're supposed to have a correction. But nobody wants to uh, you know, go through the correction. So they say, well, what we have to do is bail out companies and the various things uh, because the correction is the way they say too painful. If you don't have the bailouts, there's going to be a depression. And there was some truth to that. The people who have overextended, who, who uh, especially in the housing bubble, abused it, got into the derivatives market, and they were gambling with all the, these derivatives. Yes, they were in big trouble, and the banks owned them, and, and all the insurance companies and the banks were very much involved. So they said, there's going to be a crisis. It's going to be major. They're too big to fail. Well, the truth, the truth is, the free market tries to correct the problems of government. They should have failed. They're the ones who should have failed, yep. not... The Congress, as well as the Federal Reserve, went and bought, bought up all the bad debt. They didn't liquidate the debt. If you or I get into trouble and we're in our heads, over our heads with debt, and we want to have our own economic growth again, we have to get our debt out of the way so that we don't have to keep paying interest and accumulating more and more debt or eventually we can't borrow any more money. A country has to do that too. The debt has to be liquidated. But when they bailed out these countries, the debt was propped up. Japan did the same thing 20 years ago, and they're still in trouble. So what happened to the debt? Did the companies who held the debt and made all the money, uh, are they stuck with it? No, it's on our shoulders, it's on the middle class America, and that's why middle class America is suffering. And the very people the bleeding hearts wanted to help and give a free house to, 
Guess what? They're the ones who lost the jobs and lost their houses. And they're suffering the consequence of the inflation now. So government intervention, government planning, whether it's through the Federal Reserve or through Congress, doesn't work. The people have to plan. The people may have to decide how the money is being spent. Not the government and not the politicians and not the bureaucrats. Today, though, we have not resolved that, and it is yet to come because this debt is still hanging. Not only that, is our government, our Secretary of the Treasury, as well as the Federal Reserve, have traveled quite frequently, and they talk to the Europeans all the time. And they have essentially promised that we will bail out Europe because we have the reserve currency, and there's still some trust in the dollar. So they have essentially said, we will be there. We will not let those banks fail. Guess who the banks are? They're big banks that we have that have branch banks over there. They're intertwined. They're global in nature. And guess what? The banks and the branches in Europe, guess what they bought? They bought debt from Greece and Portugal and, and Spain. And they say, well, the debt is illiquid now. What are we going to do? Illiquid means it's worthless. But they own it. They don't want to go bankrupt. So we're over there promising more that we will be bailing them out by printing more money. But. The, the tough part of this, and they better wake up and understand it, is that you just can't do that forever. Eventually what it does, it destroys the confidence in the dollar, and right now I think that is happening. Because now the money is starting to circulate, it's been producing, created in the last four or five years. You've heard about gasoline prices, one place in Florida, gasoline prices hit six dollars the other day. And, uh, and yet, what, what does Bernanke tell us? Bernanke tells us there's no inflation. Of course, he has, a different, he has a different definition of inflation. Inflation, technically, in the free market is when you print, print money and create money. He's tripled the supply of money in these last three years. That's inflation. And then one of the consequences of inflating the currency are higher prices. So over the years, what do we have? We had high prices in the NASDAQ bubble. We had high prices in the, in the housing bubble. We have high prices wherever government gets their fingers involved in education, prices of education, much higher than the cost of living, cost of medical care, it's, it's uh, very, very high. And uh, this, and, and then they tell you, you know, there, there isn't any inflation. But even if you use the old, uh, co uh, the old calculation for the CPI, the, uh, our price is going up about 7%, and he's telling us it's going up 2%. So in, in other words, let's say it is 2%. What he's telling us is that they're allowed to steal 2% of our money every single year and then and not be and not be charged with a crime. <laughs> Matter of fact, I've asked both Greenspan and Bernanke in committee about this, about the morality of it and the economics of it. And they said, well, we have to keep interest rates low. We have to do this to keep the economy going. We have to look at the big picture and some, and some people just are going to suffer. Now that, that is them? not very nice, <laughs> because guess who suffers? The very people who might want to take care of themselves, the people who save money, the people in retirement, people living on Social Security, because their cost of living right now is going up a lot more than, than 2%. So he says that's a consequence. Now if you had a free market, you know what people might make on their CDs? It could be 6 or 7 or 8%, because that's where the market would be. And uh, but the. The other major problem when the Fed gets involved in artificially low, lower interest rates, it causes what we call malinvestment. People do things they shouldn't be doing. Even if you don't see the prices rising, they invest because they think there's been a lot of savings. They might build too many houses or build too many casinos and in Las Vegas and all the different things. So this is the mischief of the Federal Reserve and uh, eventually it will be dealt with. This is not new. Destruction of money has been around for a long time and inevitably when they finally destroy the currency they always have to go back to something that people know about and they trust and they go back just as the founders went back. They had runaway inflation with the continental dollar. They put it in the Constitution. Only gold and silver can be legal tender. And they also said, we give you no authority to establish a central bank. 
Now, immediately there was a great debate between Jefferson and Hamilton, uh, and uh, in the early years, of course, uh, uh, they kept getting rid of the National Bank, but uh, we've been suffering with this for the last, uh, you know, the last hundred years. So uh, I'm hoping on the 100th anniversary that we have a bill that we can pass that says uh, on the 100th anniversary of the Federal Reserve, we're going to have a bill that's going to repeal the Federal Reserve. <laughs> It enables governments to grow in a sinister manner. If you Jefferson didn't want to even be able to borrow money, but he he didn't win that fight. But if they tax us for everything that they do, and we had to send them a check every month. Believe me, this would all end rather quickly because the people would rebel. Matter of fact, just uh, to make that point, I introduced a bill one time to repeal withholding taxes. Why should the businessman be a slave and collect those these papers and fill out all these forms? <laughs> but, you're paying for the government and there would be a quick rebellion that would get us back on track again. <laughs> Uh, borrowing can become noticeable. If you didn't have the Fed to monetize debt, the borrowing would push interest rates up, and then the Congress would have to quit spending because uh, the more they spent, the higher the interest rates would go. But we don't have that check. And so we have the Federal Reserve that just prints the money when the federal government uh, needs the money. So it does hide things, and the victims are sometimes unknown. There's not known immediately. And, uh, and they can get away with that until the end point when the, uh, when the currency is destroyed. But in the meantime, you might have decades of this. We, we went off the gold standard completely in 1971. These last 40 years have been nothing but a big bubble uh, being formed. But during that time, just think of what has grown. The entitlement system and the warfare system. The military industrial complex that Eisenhower warned, warned us about. It's alive and well and they're spending money. And the, the thing that Really, even though I've studied this for a long time, I've been in Congress, and I know how so many of you feel, uh, they're, they're, they're living with their head in the sand. They're in oblivion in Washington. They don't even, if they thought that the problem was one-tenth as serious as I think that, uh, that it is, they would quit spending. That's what they should do. The entitlement system is uh, alive and well. Politicians did quite well uh, by, you know, just promising whatever the people wanted. We could borrow, spend. We're a wealthy nation, and we were. We were the wealthiest nation ever because we were the freest nation. Of course, today we're not the freest nation, and we're not the richest nation uh, anymore. But the entitlement system got way off base because entitlement sounds like a good, good word. You know. Uh, we're, we would like to say we're entitled to our right to our life and to, and to our liberties, but we're not entitled to somebody else's money. Entitlements have become what people through the politician demand or want or insist on. The politicians accommodate and they become entitlements. And literally, I imagine more than 50% of the people in this country still think that an entitlement is a right. An entitlement isn't a right. We get our lives and our liberty from our Creator. We get it in a natural way. We don't get it, we don't get it from, from the government. But if we have a right to our life and our liberties, we ought to have a right to keep fruits of our labor.
here because they've studied only Keynesian economics. I say, well, what will happen? We're in a recession. What would happen if the government quit spending a trillion dollars? I said, well, think of it this way. It isn't so much that the government's going to, the fact that the government's quit and spend a trillion dollars, it would be that the government would quit spending it and the people would spend a trillion dollars. And that's what would happen, and that would be much better. I, quite frankly, am very frank about what I think the nature and the uh, philosophy of a president ought to be. The president shouldn't be running the economy. You know, uh, it's a, the president doesn't know what to do. The Congress doesn't know what to do. Only the people know what to do on how to run the Get out of this mess by snapping our fingers and everything will be perfect. But I know what we're doing is wrong, it's prolonging the agony, and it's going to be worse than our depression if we don't uh, change our ways. But what, uh, what we need to do, though, is not scare people with what the correction is all about. Because I don't think we should propose our viewpoints by saying, well, I have the problems as long as you're willing to sacrifice. But why would it be that if I came along and talked to the businessman and to you in this, in this audience and say, look, what I want to do is that I want to deregulate you. I don't want the federal coming down in your states and having mandates. I don't think that's a sacrifice to have less regulations from the federal government. If, it could, if you could trust the currency. How many here now would say, well, I'm saving for my ch children's education. I'm going to buy a 20-year bond and make a half a percent or a quarter percent, and I know I'll have the purchasing power in 20 years. Nobody believes that. You know? So what if you had sound money and you could save money and you could be confident that you could take care of your future? What, not only that, the prices of education would come down. But why would it be a sacrifice to us if you didn't have any income tax? That doesn't sound like a sacrifice to me. I would think this would be wonderful. People have to change their attitude about what the role of government ought to be. And that is important because no matter how many people have in Washington, they, they will reflect the demands of the people. So if the, if the people still say entitlements are rights and we want to uh, steal money from one group and you give it to us, it's not going to work. So it, we have to change people's attitude about the role of government. But there's another area that we have to at least address, and I believe we have to change to get this correction over with. And that has to do with what we're doing overseas. Yeah. Yeah. budget's not this big, but believe me, there are a lot of other budgets that are involved in what we're doing overseas. The, the intervention, the State Department, the CIA, uh, our troops, and taking care of the wounded and all, it's costing us over a trillion dollars. Our wars in the last 10 years, 10, 11 years now, has added four trillion dollars worth of debt to our, our national debt. But just think of, what if we'd have had this $4 trillion in the economy? Just think how much richer this economy would be. And what have we gotten for all these wars? We've gotten nothing but grief. I mean, we're not spreading our Constitution. We're not spreading our goodness. We're spreading a viewpoint of America, which I don't think is a good viewpoint of America. I They have a moral obligation, starting with Woodrow Wilson, that we had to prove to the world that uh, uh, we were the most moral and, and, and most uh, wise nation, and we had the, we had the right and the obligation to force our way and, uh, and and to teach other people. They this this though doesn't work. Using force to force our goodness on anybody cancels out all the goodness. <laughs> and the richest, and we have a, a lot of wonderful traits and wonderful characteristics that we want to. 
But why don't we concentrate on a free market economy, a sound currency, protection of civil liberties, a sensible foreign policy, and then we could be a nation where other countries would want to emulate us and follow our lead. That means the people about how how much we should be involved overseas. It's not going to happen. We're going to work to the bankruptcy, and that's not real far off. So, my my position is that it should be a lot easier for liberals and conservatives and independents to come together and cut overseas spending and cut these wars. That's what I think would be the easiest. bring our troops home. As soon as now, now the, other, the other thing about this is that um, it's a way to work our way out of it. If we don't work our way out of it and have a dollar collapse, everybody's checks bounce. And, and then you have political chaos, and then I worry about our civil liberties. But if, uh, if we do this sensibly and cut the spending overseas, what, what about all this effort to worry about a border that nobody can identify between Pakistan and Afghanistan? Think of how much fighting and killing we're going to have. Nobody even knows where at all, so we just bomb everybody. You know? <laughs> but uh, what, about, what about our own borders uh, to, to the south? You know, that with a lot less resources than worrying about all those overseas border. And in the last five years, it is estimated that 50,000 people have been killed on that border down there. And uh, it involves not only, uh, I think, less so the immigration problem than our failed policy on the drug war. change our foreign policy and, and adapt the policy that the founders gave us. And even up until the mid part of the last century, many conservative Republicans endorsed. And that is, that we ought to mind our own business. And yeah. all, all these arguments, well, there's a civil war going on there and people are getting killed. They have no idea who the good guys and the bad guys are. There's probably bad guys on both sides, but we have to get involved, they say. But how many, how many times did we get involved with the most vicious of dictators? You know, from uh, Stalin to Mao Tong and all these people, they killed millions, and yet we did business with them. So this whole idea that we, the, there's war propaganda going on, the war drums are beating. They're ready to go into Syria. We don't need a war in Syria, we don't need a war in Iran, I'll tell you that. Decide to work our way 